today on Students Over Systems, we're celebrating the opportunity for a great school rethink. American Enterprise Institute education scholar Rick Hess joins us to discuss his latest book. Welcome to Students Over Systems, a podcast that celebrates education freedom. I'm your host, Jenny Gentles. At Students Over Systems, we talk with the creators, advocates, and beneficiaries of education freedom. And on today's episode, we're joined by Frederick Hess. Rick is the Senior Fellow and Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the founder of the Conservative Education Reform Network and the Grumpy Uncle of School Reform. He's the author of many books and Education Week's popular blog, Rick Hess Straight Up. He's also the executive editor of Education Next, a Forbes senior contributor, and a great guy. Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Jenny, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. So, Rick, you've written so many books. Why was it time for, for, for another one? This book is called Great School uh, Rethink, and um, it's uh, coming out this spring. And uh, what, what, was the, what was the need for, for another book on education? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for folks who are interested afterwards, it's available everywhere, at least on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com and such, uh, starting in early June. Uh, look, uh, two simple things. One, uh, a lot of the ideas that we all talk about in the community of folks uh, who want to reform schooling, who want to expand school choice, um, a lot of these ideas have been in circulation for 20 plus years. And part of the frustration is trying to get them into the system. Um, and what made this moment particularly special, I think, or not special, but <laughs> significant, um, was the pandemic just was it basically shook up American education like a giant Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, it fractured the trust between parents and schools. Uh, it rewired community routines. Uh, it caused educators to take a hard look at what they were doing and how their school systems were operating. And I think the result um, is it created a real opportunity for us to think differently um, about how schooling works and what schools are doing with our kids. One point that you made that was I found really important was that schools are such habitual parts of our lives that we forget to ask why they're organized the way they are. And something that I particularly enjoyed about the book was the history lessons that you sprinkled throughout about why uh, this we have this education system um, structured the way that it is. So could you talk a little bit about Horace Mann and common schools and why we have the school calendar and district structure structures that are in place now? Sure. Um, you know, one thing that we often lose in our uh, fights over schooling today is schools look the way they do because it served a purpose at some point. Mm -hmm. It just might not be the purpose that we need for kids and families and communities today. So, you know, back in the 1830s, 1840s, folks who've ever studied any education history will remember there was this famous guy named Horace Mann, who was executive secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, uh, came uh, to that position in 1837, and they had a big problem. Their big problem 200 years ago was that lots of folks were immigrating to the U.S. from Ireland, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and these folks were Catholic. And for the young republic, there was a lot of concern that these Catholic parents were not going to value the republic, that their first fealty was to Rome. So they started launching a common school movement. And the point of the common school movement was to build lots of schools so Catholic kids would come in and become literate so that they would read in school the King James Bible so they would be less Catholic than their parents so that they would be good American citizens. Um, that explains a whole bunch of things about why schools look like they do today. This was the emphasis on getting schooling to be universal um, everywhere. It, it took another century to make it happen. Uh, they had to rework the teacher labor force because at that point, most teachers were men, but there weren't enough men and they were too expensive to actually uh, staff these common schools. So they had to feminize the teaching profession, which led to the creation of teacher colleges so that men could teach women how to interact around kids in schools. And the result of this was a real emphasis on schools as a tool of social homogenation. 
Fast forward a century later, you have this heavily a female teaching force under the dictates of male superintendents, male principals. And there was a sense that teachers were poorly paid, weren't being paid fairly. So you had to push for things like teacher tenure and teacher pay scales, um, which were a reasonable response to the way schools were staffed in 1905 or 1915. Well, particularly when women could be fired for getting married or getting pregnant or not meeting height and weight requirements, you mentioned. And when women were paid one half or one third what their male counterparts were paid, just cut. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like a lot of times when you're talking to somebody who's a teacher and they know a little bit of this history, they and you start talking about the problems with tenure or uh, Stephen Lane pay scales, their minds go back to this. Those of us who are thinking about how these things work today are having a very different conversation. And one of the advantages of knowing the history is understanding why it looks like it does and how we got here. And sometimes it creates an opportunity to say, all right, we get why we did this a century ago, but it's actually no longer serving the purpose that it was designed to serve. All right, well, let's talk about what education was like maybe 50, 60 years ago when women had few options in the workforce. Uh, you mentioned that women were uh, graduating, like 50% of the college graduates were going on to, to be teachers or, be, or work in education. Yeah, from that time that Horace Mann and his compadres turned teaching from male work to female work till well after World War II, 1950s, 1960s, most college-educated women became teachers. Other doors were closed to them. You could be a teacher or a nurse. And so teaching was staffed. Uh, folks who were old enough might remember that generation of teachers who was retiring in the 1980s, 1990s. Incredibly talented women who today would be all kinds of high, you know, highly educated, sophisticated professions who became teachers. And in that world, you could count on teachers teaching for 30 years. And you could count on them not leaving you to go do anything else. And so we beat high, we, we built hiring systems and pay systems built on the notion that 22-year-old college-educated women were going to become teachers and we're going to do it for the next 30 years. If you're out, you know, if you're in any organization today and you're trying to recruit talented 22-year-olds who are finishing college this spring and you say to them, hey, I've got a deal for you. You can do the same job into the 2050s. And you'll be able to get incremental 4 or 5% pay, whether you're terrible at your job or you're good at your job. It is a really lousy way to try to recruit talented, dynamic young people today. It's not that it's a bad model. It's just not how America works anymore. And what's happened is we are still wedded to a way of staffing schools that made a lot of sense for a very long time, but just has nothing to do with how you hire and train and keep dynamic professionals in 21st century America. Okay, so we talked about the impetus behind cr the creation of the schools and then the the workforce and the shift to the, the female workforce. Let's talk about the changes in the students. A statistic that I found rather shocking was the percentage of students that were graduating from high school in the early 1900s. Could you talk about how, how that's changed over time? Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, and it makes a lot of sense. If you think back, a century, say to 1900, four out of five Americans worked or, on farms or in factories. In that world, education was more of a luxury than anything else. So in 1900, about 6% of Americans graduated high school, about one out of 16. Today, only about one out of five jobs is in, uh, in, on a farm or in a factory. Um, most Americans need at least a college uh, diploma if they're going to have a you know, job that'll let them support a family, that'll give them some degree of uh, independence and autonomy. And it's no surprise that today we expect everyone should be finishing high school and then going on to whatever makes sense for them. All right. So you caution that we shouldn't change things until we understand why they look the way they do. So I recommend that everybody brush up on their education history and we understand um, what things look like uh, when we first created these common schools and how little they're different now. Um, but you do say that innovation to you is a dirty word. So we obviously shouldn't be doing schools the same way that we did when Horace Mann created this common school. Um, uh, 
process. Uh, why shouldn't we be innovating? Well, look, if you walk into an Apple store and you say, sell me your most innovative iPhone, they're going to look at you like you're an idiot. You know, you know, now you might say, hey, I want a phone that has more memory than my old phone, or I might want a phone that takes better pictures, or I might want a phone that can support new apps. And the reality is, in order to create that phone, they had to innovate. But you don't look for innovation. You look for better solutions to the problems you got. And what's happened in education is we're like a whole bunch of those weird people walking into that iPhone store saying, give me something different. Because look, one of the big problems with the celebration of innovation is it can also make us think that anything that's old needs to go. And you know what? I think a lot of things that we've been doing a long time, we've done for a long time because they make sense. Um, the idea that kids should actually know the content of American history, not very innovative, but it makes a lot of sense. The idea that kids ought to make sure that we ought to make sure kids can read and do math before we promote them to grade four or to middle school may not be a new idea, but it makes a lot of sense. So part of the problem with innovation is it almost teaches us that we're supposed to focus on what's shiny and new rather than focus on the things that are good for kids and good for families. All right. So we do have some problems to be solved and we do want to solve some practical problems. Uh, can you lay out some of the problems that you address in, in the book? Uh, an example would be too much school time wasted. Uh, yeah. What are some other examples of some, some of the problems yeah. you tackle? I mean, and this is, you know, that's what we started with, um, the, you know, what's different about now in some sense, not a lot. Um, you know, Jenny, you and I have talked <laughs> about, you know, the frustration of parents who can't find the right program or school for their kid. Uh, you know, kids have been bored in school since time, you know, and since time immemorial. Uh, we see today that so many kids seem socially disconnected or fragile, partly because they spend so much time online and have so many fewer relationships in the real world. What should we be doing? We should be trying to make sure that schools give kids the education they need. That means they need to know content. It means they need to develop their skills. It means they need mentors and healthy relationships. How do we do this? Well, a couple of the places where we're blowing the opportunity is one, we waste a lot of time. People don't realize this. You'll often hear that we need to spend more time in school. But American kids spend more time in school than their international peers around the world, about 100 hours more per year from K to nine. Now, there's also a lot of evidence that lots of this time, hundreds of hours every year are wasted in ridiculous ways. Second thing we need to do is make sure that good and effective teachers are spending their time teaching and not spending their time doing ridiculous things. A third is we got to make it easier for parents to customize. School choice is part of that. But one of the challenges when we talk about school choice is a lot of parents may like their school, but that doesn't mean they like what's happening in their school. They might not like the math program. They might not like the fact that foreign language is taught by a long-term sub. They might not like the values that are being imparted in American history or civics. And so when we talk about, you know, many of us have pointed out repeatedly that school choice really you know, as your slogan, students over systems, really needs to be more about educational choice, really needs to be more about equipping families to make sure they're getting their kids what they need, whether that's moving the kid to a new building or whether that's making sure the education is serving the kid in other ways. Well, you know that I'm going to want to delve into more of your ideas on school choice or education freedom. But before we do that, I, I just want to talk a little bit more about the time in school and the school calendar. There's a myth out there that the school calendar was set to accommodate an agrarian schedule. That myth doesn't actually make any sense. And you address that in the book. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, you know, now look, I, 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 this is stuff I, other people have taught me. I'm a suburban guy, so I didn't grow up, you know, in farm country. But anybody who's a farm country will tell you, they say, look, the idea that a school calendar which goes off for the summer and starts in the fall and runs through the spring, that this is agrarian, is about the dumbest thing you ever heard of. They say, you know what, we got planting season and we've got sowing season. And planting season tends to be in the spring and sowing season in the fall. So the idea that farmers are worried about getting kids out for the summer just doesn't make a lick of sense. What really happened um, back in the middle, late 1800s was 
folks got to remember that we haven't always had air conditioning. We haven't always had modern plumbing. So in cities like Boston and New York and Baltimore, summer was a nightmare. Uh, temperatures were getting into the 80s and 90s. There was no AC. Uh, you had open human waste running in the gutters. There were lots of diseases. So the idea behind summer vacation was that in order to keep kids and communities safe, it made a lot of sense to try to make sure, A, kids weren't together in closed rooms that were a million degrees, and B, that whenever possible, you got folks out of the city uh, into the countryside. Well, in our world today, things actually look a little different. Um, we now have AC. A lot of single parents in particular are scrambling to find how to take care of their kids during the summer. Uh, it's not easy to get your kid out of Baltimore or Boston into some leafy kind of country community, even if you want to. So look, summer vacation works fabulous for some families. I wouldn't want any change because I love the time we get with our kids and the, and, and the opportunities they get. For lots of families, though, summer vacation, as it was constructed 150 years ago, doesn't make a lick of sense. They're worried about how do you keep your kids off devices. They're worried about what their kids are doing all day. And they actually want schools to offer those kinds of structured, engaging, humanized activities. Problem is, we tend to talk about a longer school year or as one size fits all. And what we ought to really be talking about is how do we figure out the school programming that gives different families what they need for their kid? All right. So let's talk about technology. Let's change the subject uh, a little bit. You say we ping from tech mania to frustrated disappointment and back again. And those of us who uh, had kids in public school uh, prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, and then even after the pandemic have seen there's an obsession with the device. Everybody has an iPad. Well, great. What are they doing with that iPad? And there's an obsession with the, the apps. Uh, your, your kids on, uh, I'm not even, a dream box. Make sure they're doing dream box. Well, what are they learning and are they mastering basic skills on, on dream box? Um, let's, let's talk about like, why is there obsession with technology and what kind of problems is it causing for teachers? And students. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you ever want to laugh, go back and read sometime about the stuff that got written over time about the introduction of the pencil or the radio. There, there was there, there were books written about radio as being the schoolhouse of the air. And the U.S. Office of Education a century ago created the Office of Radio. And teachers no longer had to teach because kids would just listen to the radio. And then they realized there were all kinds of problems with this. Like the radio wasn't necessarily teaching the lessons the schools were supposed to be doing. So look, the idea that technology doesn't deliver is not a new insight. This is something that we learn over and over, uh, over the last 150 years or more. Real question is, if you think about the run-up to the pandemic and all of the excitement for the flipped classroom and the idea that, wow, this is going to be awesome. And then we got the pandemic. And kids were online and learning online. And we were like, wow, this is terrible. What's going on? I think the simplest way to think about it is that technology is good when it lets schools do more of the human stuff. Now, that's a little counterintuitive. So we said again, technology is good when it lets schools do more of the human stuff. The idea of the flipped classroom done right is really best understood by terms of this really powerful, awesome technology. That, that, that we've learned about over time, uh, was introduced about five centuries ago called the book. What the book did was instead of having a teacher have to stand in front of a bunch of students and tell them everything, you could give students the book and they could read it and go home and then they could come in and ask questions. What the book allowed teachers to do was spend more time mentoring kids, explaining ideas, answering questions, and less time just telling them stuff. So when we talk about all of these new, you know, Chrome, Chromebook and iPhone based apps that kids are spending time on, if kids are spending a lot of time staring at screens, whether it's AI assisted or not, um, if they're not interacting with real human beings, if they are jumping through a bunch of hoops in order to kind of show process mastery, that's a problem. If, on the other hand, 
we're using these things so the kids are getting introduced to cool um, multimedia demonstrations of how the solar system works and are then coming back to a classroom where the teacher's having them do hands-on projects, where they're building planets, where they're actually asking questions, where they're getting orally quizzed on what they've mastered and not mastered, then that technology can be a supercharged kind of opportunity for them to master the content and then digest it with the teacher and their classmates. So what parents just always need to remember is it's not, are, is your school district buying a lot of tech? It's what are the teachers in those classrooms doing with kids? And is the tech making that more dynamic and engaging and rigorous or not? Right. And have the teachers been trained to use the tech, right? It, it can't just be that the district has this huge contract with a technology company and maybe the tech support will help with the glitches, which are, you mentioned, quite disruptive to teachers and to student learning time. Uh, they also need to make sure that teachers know how to effectively use tech to improve learning, which you mentioned the studies are showing that that's not really happening. Um, all right. So some parents, think, I don't want a public school that's all about the tech, that's all about the apps, that is not engaged in um, making sure that my, my child learns. I actually want pencils and textbooks and old-fashioned learning. And that's where a parent like me is very happy in a little private school that has a more traditional approach. So let's talk to, about school choice, which empowers parents to, to make those choices and, and find a school that's, that's meeting their needs. You have a couple interesting quotes when you start uh, talking about school choice, both of which involve the word weird. And uh, one point in the book, you said that, that it's like a weird morality play. The notion that one is either for empowering parents or for supporting public education is a misleading one and that real parents don't think this way. And then your other weird quote was, it's downright weird that educational choice has focused so narrowly on students changing schools. All right, so Rick, what is choice to you and how do we get out of this weird morality play? Sure. I mean, the, the simplest thing to keep in mind is even after the pandemic, even after parent, you know, four out of five parents say American education on a whole is on the wrong path, even after our parents will give you a litany of horror stories about watching their kids at the kitchen table and these little muted Zoom boxes for three hours during the pandemic, even after all that, 75% of parents give their kids public school in A or B. And 75% of parents support school choice uh, pretty much across the board, whether you're talking about charters or vouchers or education savings accounts. And people who do what we do tend to be very confused by this. They say, how can parents like their kids' public schools and like school choice? And I'm always like, that's just weird. For parents, there's no tension here. They like their kids' school because many times they've moved to their community because of that. It's where they've met their neighbors. It's where you go and see the kids in a play. It's where you go watch football on Friday night. But especially now, especially after the disruptions and the broken trust of the last few years, they also say we ought to have the right to make sure we're getting for our kid what they need. So for me, I, I think the way I think about school choice is it's not about blowing up school districts. It's not about um, conversa abstract conversations about zip code education or failing government schools. It's real simple. It's, can we say that we respect and appreciate why families would like their community institutions, whether those are schools or churches or soccer leagues or anything else, but also that we believe families ought to have the ability to make the decision to serve their kid. And then I think the weird thing about the narrow focus on school choice is if you think about education, education is best basically nothing but a giant sticky ball of choices. Uh, you're making choices about what, what, when, at what age could your kids start kindergarten? Districts are making choices about zoning, about discipline policies. Uh, schools and teachers are making uh, decisions about, you're making choices about how much homework to assign, how to grade kids, what to, schools are nothing but choices. And for some kids, the choices that are made, especially in terms of policy and pedagogy, might be a bad fit. And in some cases, that might mean that families who don't like their school and don't have the resources or ability to go to another school um, need programs that allow them to do that. And that's great. But it also means 
that we ought to be all about giving parents more opportunities to make all kinds of choices that support their kid, giving them access to career and technical education programs, uh, giving them access to learning pods. I mean, one of the weird things was during the, uh, the pandemic, instead of school districts saying, hey, we know some families are having trouble putting learning pods together, especially low-income families or families that don't have all the resources, we're going to lean into that and we're going to help connect them and help them find a teacher. Instead, you saw folks like NPR and Washington Post railing against the millions of parents who put together learning pods as somehow bad people who are perpetuating inequality. I'm like, look, the business of education should be about empowering families, empowering parents to make sure kids, all of whom are profoundly different, are getting the teaching and learning and support they need. And a choice movement, I think, ought to embrace that rather than try to turn that into an abstraction. All right. So one question about something that I wonder if the choice movement is maybe not addressing enough and maybe the parental rights movement is not addressing enough. And that is you mentioned that the job of parents and guardians is to send children to school who are responsible, respectful and ready to learn. Are we leaning too heavy on the like parents are right, students uh, should be prioritized and not leaning heavy enough on like, hey, parents have a responsibility and students need to shape up? Yeah, I think so. I, I think this is, um, and it's, it's a weird, ironic um, consequence of one of the great victories of, of modern school reform. I used to supervise student teachers in Boston in the 1990s uh, for Harvard. And one of the strange things um, about back then when I taught or then when I supervised student teachers is it was not hard to find teachers who would say, I can't teach that kid. I can't teach those kids. Um, it wasn't just about race. People will sometimes suggest it's just about race. It was about class. It was about attitude, but it was considered something that teachers would say out loud. One of the great successes of the last 25 years, mm -hmm. no child left behind in the rest, was we made it a moral premise that the job of educators is to educate all their kids. Teachers will still say stuff like this occasionally, but they'll whisper it in the parking lot. They won't say it out loud because they understand it's not okay to say, I can't teach that kid. The consequence of this, though, is that we've created a culture where we've got way too many um, folks in and around education who are scared to say the other side of it who are scared to say, look, we can't blame kids and parents, but this is a partnership. If you take your kid to a doctor, to a pediatrician, and the pediatrician says, Rick, Blake's a little heavy. Uh, he's eating too many Doritos. You got it. And the first thing I do when I get home with Blake is I tear open a bag of Doritos and say, go to it, pal. We don't say that's a bad pediatrician. We say the pediatrician can only do so much that the pediatrician can tell me what to do, can offer support. But as a parent, I got to be the one who's saying it's time to do homework. We're going to read together. It's time to turn off the lights. It's time to wake up and get your butt to school. And we cannot be in the business of turning a blind eye to that and somehow imagining that we can let parents who aren't doing their part off the hook and then just yell at schools without educators feeling scapegoated or like they're being put in a position where they can do what they're being asked to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we definitely prioritize students over systems here. We definitely want to empower parents. We want, we want to make sure that everybody is taking full responsibility for their role. Rick, thank you so much for talking with us today. And um, thank you for walking us through elements of the great school rethink uh, for listeners who are interested in finding out how to free ourselves from Horace Mann's clammy grip. Can you remind us uh, where people can find this book? Uh, sure. Um, you can find it at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, Harvard Education Press, and hopefully some of the local bookstores near you. But uh, that's always a, uh, you know, a crapshoot nowadays. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. I enjoyed our conversation. Hey, great to be with you. Thanks. We hope listeners found today's conversation informative and encouraging. If you enjoyed this episode of Students Over Systems, please consider leaving a review on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends. To learn more about the work of the IWF Education Freedom Center, please visit iwf.org slash EFC. 
Thank you for listening to Students Over Systems. Until next time, keep celebrating education freedom and brighter futures.